past. My sadness is past. I'm happy at last. I'm happy at last. His love lights the way for me. These trials or comes and strength to my soul and faithful I'll ever be. The billows of grace now over me roll. His love lights the way for me. His love lights the way. I travel today. I travel today. I'm shouting. One more, page 300. We shall see the king.
more time I sing. Well, we shall see the King. Oh, oh, we, we shall, shall see, see the King. We, we shall, shall see, see the King when He comes. Hallelujah! He's coming in time. We'll, we'll have the blessed life. life. We, we shall see, see the King. king. There's a great outpouring in the last days, according to what's called. 
You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I
number one would surely be me I thought I would be what I wanted to be I thought that I could build on life seeking sand but I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I thought that number one would surely be me. I thought I would be what I wanted. To be, I thought that I could build on life seeking sand, but I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Lord, I can't. As a mighty big man, but I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Oh, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. All oh, those mountains.
I know I told you this story one time before. About this song. This song right here was a song that was written by a broken pastor and his wife. They told her the story that one night this singing group, it was called the Green Family, and the man and the woman that wrote this song live right down here in Live Oak Block. They gave their life for 50-something years to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, those dark winds come along and took everything they had. Took the children. Took the parents' life. And they looked around and they said, Lord, where do we go? Where do we go? And one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, the Lord woke them up. And they sat down at the piano. And they started writing these words and singing this song. And they gave it to the Green family. I don't know if you know the Green family or not. They sung the gospel music. Some of them still singing. And Tony Green made this song famous by singing it one night. And not long after that, very short time, Tony went on be with the Lord cancer come along took his life and every time I hear this song this song reminds me of me and I can't even walk without me holding my hand you know you try and try and you try and you try and you try and the, and the devil just keeps coming along and just keeps knocking you down. But sometimes when I get off by myself, and those days have been hard, and things come up against me, the song comes to my mind, and I start singing it. And those things that come along and knock me down that day or that week seem to all fade away when I start thinking about it those men and women that have lost everything that they got and here I am having a pity party or throwing some kind of little fit because the devil gets in my way or knocks me down But I know I can walk with him holding my hand. I can get up every day and him holding my hand. And I know we've had tragedy in this church. Lots of tragedy in the last couple months. But really, it started about a year and a half ago. But you know what? We can walk every day with Jesus holding our hand.
without you holding my hand. Oh, the mountains too high and the valleys too wide.
Praise the Lord. I tell you, it's a blessing to be here this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 6. I told Pastor, I said, as long as my voice will go, and as long as I can hold up, I'm going to get through this message. This is a win, just being up here today and being back in church. You see, the devil doesn't want any one of us here in service. He wants us to stay home. He wants us to be away from the people of God and away from a move of God. Um, so 2 Samuel chapter 6, and it says in verse 1, Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and, the, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And if you look at the very beginning of verse 8, it says that David was displeased. Numerous other translations there say that David was angry. Verse 9 says that David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Today I want to talk to you about this, and it's a very, very uh, important thing that I believe each one of us needs to understand today. Don't abandon your blessings. We live in a time right now where that's exactly what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to take the presence of God, he wants us to take the blessings of God, and he wants us to just forget about them and cast them aside and just go about our daily business because life happens. So if we could, for just a moment, if you can set your Bibles down, uh, let's just pray and let's ask God today. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me and help me to understand that I need your blessings more than anything else in this life. Brother Reggie sang it. He said, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. We need to pray today, God, open my eyes and help me to see in a brand new way. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for the praise and the music that's gone forth. And we thank you for your presence in this house. God, I pray today that you would just open up our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive your word the way you would have it, Lord God. That you would help us, Lord Jesus, to grab hold tightly to even just the hem of your garment. To not let go, to never let go, and to do all that we can to draw close to you, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that your word would accomplish its purpose in this house today, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord some praise? Yes. Hallelujah. God is so good, you can be seated. Something I didn't have written down, but it was just while I was thinking about the service and this morning while I was praying and preparing for the message, uh, I have them. I, I typically put scriptures on the lock screen of my phone. That way, in the million times I look at it during the day, I have a scripture of encouragement there. And the scripture that I have on my phone right now is actually Psalms 34 and 14. And it says in that verse of scripture, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And even if it's not a sinful lifestyle that, that you, it would say that you would depart from, I, I interpret it as meaning this. Don't let the evil of the world around you hold you down. Don't let it hold you back. Do good anyways. Seek peace and pursue it. And if you're going to pursue something, you're not going to get it without some kind of effort, without, as the way I say it, saw it was, if you want peace, you better be willing to chase after it. 
And I believe right now we live in a time and in a world that there's chaos at every corner and we desperately need the peace of God, not just any peace, but the peace of God that passes all understanding. We need that in our lives today, now, in this very moment. Um, because when we look at life, delays, distractions, and disruptions, detours, they all happen. They happen in our lives, and they, the, the enemy works on us. And I, I can tell you, it seems like sometimes the harder you try to do right, the more that will go wrong. It's not through any fault of our own. It's just something that happens. And when we look at our life right now, routines and traditions that we have become accustomed to happening around us, they've, they've been met with uh, resistance. Um, we've seen it, uh, you know, Brother Reggie just mentioned it in the last year and a half. Disruptions to our normal schedule have become commonplace. And I'm sure that everyone here can understand that. I'm sure that all of us here have experienced that in some way, shape, or form when something goes wrong or something comes in to disrupt and we have all of these different types of sicknesses. Pastor didn't plan to be out sick. Pastor didn't plan uh, for the services. I mean, let's look at... Uh, go back all the way to 2019. I can remember a point coming up right to the end of the year 2019 and coming into the first few months of 2020. I, I remember us having powerful services. And I remember there being such, such a powerful move of God. And I can remember feeling from each service to the next, it felt like we were building spiritual momentum. Like I said, powerful services. Man... Praise team was on it. We got some messages, and those messages came in to encourage us, to inspire us, and empower us. God was preparing us for something, and while we didn't know what it was, it was still there. And I think we can look back now, hindsight being 2020, we can look back and see that 2020 was what God was preparing us for. But while we were building up that momentum, the presence of God was very active in this house, and it was very evident in our lives. And then, the door shut. And it was a shock to our system. It was something we were not prepared for. If there's a person in this house or watching online right now, and you say, well, I was ready for it. I don't think that I can believe that. Because it became awkward for all of us at some point, but... It, our schedules. Sunday was still the Lord's day, but there seemed to be a hole there because we couldn't really gather together in the same way. We had our online Sunday school uh, through Zoom meetings. We had Facebook Live services. And I know when, we first, when I first came in and started working on the Facebook Live, I've mentioned this before, it was awkward to see the musicians at play and pastor preach, and there was nobody in the church house but me which some messages made me feel that way anyways. But it was a shock to our system, and in spite of the fact that Sunday was still God's day, and in spite of the fact that we still had a way to tune in, to get the Word of God, to be fed the meat of the Word, the way God wanted us to receive it, it still had an impact on each one of us. For some of us, that impact could never even be put into words. It seemed like there was a line and we could only go so far. Push as you might, you just couldn't get past it. And even as the year progressed and we were able to come back and start uh, slowly gathering together and being in church, it still felt like something was off. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. All right? It felt like something was off even when I was coming to these services. Yes, God was moving. The praise team, and under the circumstances that were there, they did fantastic. Pastor came in and preached some amazing messages. God moved in the house, and we were blessed because through all of that, the ministry of this church expanded. No longer were the Sunday morning messages kept between these walls. No, they were broadcast online. And we've been doing that for a little over a year now. And, well, technology willing, 
And we've, I believe that it's really helped to make an impact in the lives of many people around who would not normally come and be in service with us. It gave them the opportunity to hear the Word of God in a way that could touch them and bless them wherever they were. You go out of town and you think, well, I sure hate to miss church service. Well, now you can just pull it right on up and listen as you drive. That's a blessing. God has made a way for us to hear the Word and receive it no matter where we could be. And it still, something didn't feel right. The momentum that we had been building had come to that screeching halt. And I would tell you just... Like I said, I'm going to be honest with you, and I don't have this in my notes, but just thinking about it right now. The Bible says to enter his courts with thanksgiving in your heart and enter his gates with praise. Hallelujah. See? Man, that was on cue. But that's what the Bible tells us. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and enter his courts with praise. That's what we're commanded to do. And yet, when we were beginning to come back to church, we were social distancing. We we were concerned with how far apart we sat from one another. Heaven forbid someone cough in the middle of service. Trust me, nobody was thinking, praise God. They were thinking, what was that? They were paying attention to that. They might not get anything the preacher said, but they'll remember the cough for about two weeks thinking, am I I all right? I hope that wasn't. But we came in with a mindset that was preoccupied before we ever sat on a pew and before the first song was ever sang or the first scripture ever read. It's not something that we were doing intentionally. We were coming to church with the mindset that God was going to move in our lives and that God was going to pour out His blessings upon His people so that we could be blessings to others. That was the intention, but it didn't stop the concern and the worry and the slight level of distraction. You see, last week, Pastor preached a message on discouragement. And honestly, I don't think that there could be any better time to preach a message like that than right here and now because we certainly live in a time where discouragement is running rampant. The enemy, he will do everything he can to beat us down. It is his sole mission to get in people's ears and to tell them all the things they don't need to hear to keep them away from God. And his strategy is the same every single time. Isolate and insulate. Why? Because he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't want us to gather together. He wants us separated from one another. He doesn't want us to enjoy fellowship and to exhort one another. He doesn't want us to rub shoulders with strong people. He doesn't want us to draw nigh to God or to abide in God and His Word. He wants us to forget where our help comes from. And the scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? Well, I know that at some point or another, somebody has thought this, and I'll tell you, myself included, how could I possibly experience the joy of the Lord when it seems like the devil just keeps coming from one thing to the next? He just doesn't quit. He is persistent in what he does. And really when I think about it, that should inspire us. Because if we were as persistent seeking after the will of God, as persistent in prayer, as persistent in studying the word of God as he is to try to tear us down, we wouldn't have to worry about revival. We ask questions sometimes. Why? Why, Lord? We ask, when will it end? And then the one that I would always advise you not to ask, well, what could come next? Never ask that question. I will tell you this. um, 
I think it was the Saturday before I got sick, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I told him, I said, boy, it seems like it's just been one thing after another I've had to deal with. I can't wait to see what happens next. Three days later, I tested positive for COVID, and there we go. And I still haven't really recovered from that. It's just been a, a kind of a long road. But I told pastor, I said, I have to preach this message. I have to be at church this morning. I have to have the ability to go before God because I believe that if the, I allow the devil to keep pushing me down, he's got the edge. But that's not the way it goes. God said, I've given you everything you need to be victorious. And if you don't embrace it, and if you don't make, may take it and make it a part of your life, then defeat is as good as guaranteed. You see, his objective is to beat down the saints of the church so far that they'll never, ever see the light of day again. And it's easy to come into church or be, be around brothers and sisters and, and, and to say, you know, just to put on a brave face and to uh, appear to be fine to others. But the reality is, inside sometimes there's turmoil brewing there's frustration growing there is a, a a building hopelessness a level of discouragement that has been laid atop on top of you with the intent to destroy you now I want to ask you a question this morning how many of you believe that the word of God is infallible it's infall the infallible word of God. You can stand on everything written in this book. That word infallible means incapable of making mistakes or being wrong, never failing, always effective. So this right here, if I can pick it up, this is incapable of making mistakes. God can't give you bad advice. You'll only find good stuff in here because it's always effective and it never fails. So with that being said, I'm going to read you some scriptures of the infallible Word of God. John 10 and 10. I only want to read you the first part now because it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. Ain't that positive? That's why the thief comes into your life, to steal, kill, and destroy. And now I've heard many people say God can do anything but fail. So he doesn't lie. He tells it like it is. And we were warned. Perilous times shall come. In this world you shall have tribulation. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That is the infallible word of God warning us. So we shouldn't think it anything unusual when things start to go wrong or when we face adversity. The Amplified Bible in John chapter 10 and 10 says, The thief comes only. That's the only reason he comes into your life. To steal any bit of hope that you have. To kill any progression or momentum that you might have. And to destroy you completely and entirely. But see, that's the good thing about it. With the warning comes assurance. Because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and not just a little bit. He said, I want you to have it abundantly, to the full, overflowing, to the point where you just can't contain it. Galatians 6 and 9, the infallible word of God tells us not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Psalms 46 and 1 encourage us by saying that God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in time of trouble. And then Jesus himself in Matthew 11 and 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, he said, everybody that is weary, that is tired, that is worn down, that is heavily burdened, he said, come to me and I will give you rest. Throughout the Bible, the whole word of God, we are given promises of assurance, deliverance, and provision. We are given words of encouragement and hope. 
in God and through His Word, you can find peace to calm every single storm in your life and every storm you will ever face. And the devil doesn't want us to know that. He wants us to forget about that and to focus on the bad things that keep popping up and keep happening. Me and my wife have, uh, have just marveled with the prayer request and the things that had just seemingly gone wrong recently that come across the group me app. Every day it seems like we can pull up Facebook or social media or some kind and get some kind of bad news. But I want to tell you something. that, that While that might be bad news now, God's got good news on the horizon. He said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So when the sun rises, everything's going to change. All those dark clouds are going to get rolled away. And God is going to do something powerful. But first you've got to make it through the storm. I found in life that the harder you try to move forward for God, the harder the devil will fight to hold you back. Have you ever seen a fish swim upstream before? Do you know why they do that? It would be easier to swim with the current, right? But they swim upstream. And the reason why they do that is for migration purposes. They do that to better prepare and protect the future. Not, they're not thinking about where they are in that precise moment. They're thinking about what will come from the struggle they're currently dealing with. They make themselves vulnerable and it's a tiring just absolutely draining process. But they do it, and it's by instinct. It's not because they get together and say, hey, boys, you want to swim upstream? No, it's an instinct that's embedded into their mind. They know that in spite of the struggle they are currently dealing with, trying to go against the current, there's something greater off in the distance that they're seeking after. Like I said... The threats will come, but they know that no matter how difficult the journey, they must persevere. If we look at my text today, David, man, he sought to bring the Ark of the Covenant home. He wanted to do the right thing. He had the very best of intentions, but David being David... Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he was not immune to struggle, discouragement, or hardship. Now this is one of the, the, the greats in the Bible. Everybody likes to talk about King David and how he was a mighty warrior and a great king. But he still had moments. The enemy didn't just leave him alone. Because he was chosen by God. No, if anything, that made him more probable to be attacked, more likely to be attacked. David was excited. David couldn't wait to bring the ark back home. And he didn't want to go alone, so he gathered together 30,000 people out of the house of Israel. And he said, let's go. Hey, guys, grab your instruments. Put on your garments of praise and don't forget your shouting shoes because we're fixing to have just a blowout. This is going to be awesome. But it didn't take long before their joyous celebration turned to sadness. You see, they showed up, and everybody who came, they played before the Lord on every instrument. They came in, and they were prepared to praise, ready to worship. Their intent was right. Everything about what they were doing, they had the right mindset. But... Doing good things for God is often met with resistance. We can have any number of good services, but I'm telling you, that don't mean that the devil's just going to say, you know what, have at it. No, he's going to do everything he can to disrupt it. He doesn't want the move of God happening in the church, outside the church, in your personal life. He doesn't want to see souls saved and baptized. He wants every single one of us here today and watching online, He wants us to, and, and I, I'm just going to be blunt, He wants us to burn in hell. That's the absolute truth. He's, he doesn't want to pull any punches. He will do everything He can to deceive us. So when you look at this situation in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it wasn't David's fault that the oxen stumbled. It wasn't Uzzah's. All right, can you imagine? 
They're going along. They're praising. They're having a good old time. And the devil's leaning against a tree, and he's like, watch this. Sticks out his foot to trip that ox. Instinctively, Uzzah reaches up. Because most of us, we have an instinct. I mean, when you see something about to fall and you're near it, and you place value on it, my little nephew is starting to crawl, but before too long, he's going to be starting to walk. And when that happens, it will be an instinct when you see him begin to stumble and go over. It will be an instinct to reach out and grab him. And Uzzah in this moment instinctively reaches up to stop the ark from falling over. And it was in that moment that God struck him dead. He did not mean any harm. He did not mean any disrespect. His intentions, just like David's, were good. But it didn't stop it from happening. The devil succeeded in that moment of disrupting their celebration. It was over. No more singing and dancing. No more music. In fact, they just said, you know what? Maybe we don't want to bring this home after all. They wanted to do something great for God. Now, understanding what the Ark of the Covenant is, it represented the presence of God. It rep represented His provision. It re represented His uh, blessings. It represented His promises. And they willingly said, you know what? We're just going to take this and leave it on the roadside. Leaving behind the presence of God. Leaving behind the blessings of God because they hit one speed bump. Now, I know that, that, was, that was quite the event. And I know that it was probably terrifying. And the scripture tells us that David was displeased, that he was angry, that he was afraid. He questioned himself. He questioned his ability to please God. Anybody here ever been in that position before? Because you tried to do something right, but it didn't go the way you planned. You met resistance along the way and struggle ensued and suddenly you begin to second guess yourself and your ability to see God's will come to pass perfectly within your life. The Amplified Bible in 2 Samuel 6 and 10 says that David did not just push it aside. It says that he was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord. Unwilling. No longer cared to. He decided instead to leave it at the house of Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel 6 and 11. And I'm going to try to wrap this up shortly. It says that the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. It was there for three months. And for three months, the blessings of God were on that household. Sometimes we give up too quickly. Sometimes we give up too easily. Yeah, things are going to get tough. Yeah, we're going to get tired and, and things are going to get wearisome. And, it, and, and it's going to take a toll on us spiritually and physically. And I understand that. But Paul... Oh, Paul. Paul said this, Romans 8, 18. And this is how you know that Paul was from the southern part of town. He said, for I reckon. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared. What you deal with in this life is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What you're dealing with now is nothing compared to what God is going to bless you with later. The blessing is worth the battle. <laughs> Philippians 1 and 6, Paul told us to be confident. Be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If anybody knew about struggle or hardship, it was Paul. He told us to glory in our tribulations. He said to joyfully rejoice in our sufferings and struggles. Why? Because ten verses later, after he said... What you're dealing with now can't compare to the glory of God. In Romans 8 and 28, he said, and, and it's already been said, we know. Do you know? Do you know? We know that all things, good, bad, and everything in between, all things work together for the good because God's got his hand in it. 
God's got his hand in it. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. God has placed those trials and those battles and those storms in our life for a purpose. And it will all work out in the good. We may not see it in the moment, but I'm telling you, God's doing something powerful right now, even in our church. Why? Because the devil keeps trying to disrupt it. He keeps trying to give us setback after setback after setback. And we have to fix it into our mindset that I'm not going to accept the setbacks. I'm going to look forward to the comeback. Psalm 62 and 8 says to trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Psalms chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, they, they kind of repeat that. It says that Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed. So if you ever think that you've been oppressed, it says He will be a, a refuge for you. A refuge in times of trouble. It says that they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that what? Seek thee. Not just sit there. Seek thee. If we trust him and we seek him, he will be a refuge for those that are under oppression. He will not ever forsake a single one of his children in spite of the struggles they deal with. Hey, David, you hear about Obed-Edom? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. That, that's where we left the ark at, right? Mm-hmm. Sure did. Did you hear that for the last three months, God has richly blessed him and his whole household? Wow. Wait. Didn't you leave it there? You, you decided to just, man, they must be thankful for what you did. Think about how many blessings you missed out on. <gasps> David... In one moment, and experienced something he didn't anticipate, and it caused him to doubt. And doubt led him to a detour. He second-guessed the power of God. He second-guessed the provision of God. He second-guessed the promises of God. And he said, you know what, guys? This is just way too dangerous. We're comfortable where we are. Let's just cast it aside. Let's just abandon our cause. We don't really need the blessings of God. That's essentially what he said. And how many times have we backed down in the face of resistance? How many times did we stop pushing forward because life started pushing back? How many blessings have we left on the proverbial table because we met a little bit of resistance and decided, you know what, here's fine. We don't have to get any closer. You go to some big event, and you're thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to get right on the front row. You get in there, and there's a crowd, and you're like, you know what? I'm just going to sit right here. I'm fine back here. I can see back here just fine. God does not want us to have that type of mentality. Because the resistance that we encounter, God has intended for his people to be overcomers. It does not say that we will be made stationary by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It doesn't say that you're just going to settle by the blood of the Lamb or the word of your testimony. It says you'll be an overcomer because the intention is to overcome and move forward. Musicians, you can go ahead and come. If you don't take anything away from this service today, this morning, I would tell you this. Remember that what you are facing now could never compare with the glory that God has waiting for you. The Spirit is willing. But believe me when I say I know the flesh is weak. I have been able to, throughout this message, to breathe and to talk the best I have in a month. That is by the grace and mercy of God. I might go home after this and I might crash and wake up tomorrow. But let me tell you something. As weak as my flesh may get. Paul understood it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 9. God said to Paul. My grace is sufficient. Yes, Understand. That even when our efforts fall short. 
even when our attentions, no matter how good they may be, just can't come to pass. Even when we just can't seem to do what we think God needs, He says, my grace is still sufficient for you. No matter how many times you fall short or fail, my grace is still sufficient for you. No matter how weak you are, He told Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul learned that when he was weak, that's when he was strong. And it was in a moment of weakness that David... Walked away from the presence of God. Now, I just want to say this. If you have ever encountered an issue in your life, in church or out, and you just thought, you know what? I don't have to go to church. I'm just going to sit back. I ain't going to do it. I'm done. Uh, So-and-so offended me. So-and-so hurt my feelings. You know, I'm done. That's where David was. And he walked away from that ark. And he walked away from the presence of God. But let me tell you something. As weak as David was in that moment, God's strength never waned. He did not weaken one bit. And if we look through the entire infallible word of God, he was a way maker and a promise keeper in the Old Testament. He was a light in the darkness in the New Testament. And when each and every one of us, when we were at our very worst, God was And always has been at his very best. And he doesn't change. When we look at David, we see the rest of the story. It says in 2 Samuel 6, 12, it says that it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him. Because of the ark of God. It was because of what David left behind. The blessing that David abandoned on the roadside. It says that so David went and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David, not with fear or sadness, but it says with gladness. And it was so that when they they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. Six steps, every six steps, they stopped what they were doing, they sacrificed, and they praised God and thanked Him for it. Sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to stop getting caught up in the moment of the struggle and just praise God anyways. You want to see something break out in church? Let me tell you something. Don't worry about what you've been going through. God knows. God understands. And God is ready to do something in your life. And it says that after that, after they decided that every six steps were going to stop, David danced before the Lord with all his might. In verse 15 it says that David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpets. David didn't think about what happened before. He he, he didn't think about how it held him back. No, I'm telling you today, don't forget where God has brought you from. Don't forget what God has brought you through. Because it's the blessings of your past that help fuel the blessings that will come in your future. There's no mountain too high and no valley too wide. And I would tell you today, Jesus said it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Everybody who is weary, beaten up, beaten down, And overburdened, what did he say? Come to me and I'll give you rest. So as we stand in this house, I just want to tell you something. It's the word of God, it says, and and I've already read the scripture. Trust in him at all times. Pour your heart out to him. Seek after him. You want peace? You've got to pursue it. So if there's something, anything that you need in your life from God right now, do you need strength? Do you need life and life more abundantly? Do you need rest? Don't let the struggle cause you to abandon your blessing. Because God's got something for you on the way. And the only person that will prohibit
after God's own heart because he left things on the side. It was because he gave everything he had to God. And I'll tell you right now, it doesn't matter what you've been dealing with and how hard things have been. And I, I, I get that there's just been so much heartache and just so much hardship that has just been weighing on us. Well, it's time to get that monkey off your back for a bit. These altars are open. And I think it was Peter that said to cast all your cares into Christ because he cares for you. And so as they begin to sing and play, these altars are open. I implore you, please, if you don't want to come down here to these altars, make where you are an altar. Use the altar of your heart, but please don't let the enemy hinder you from growing closer to God and attaining that which he has promised you. Let's find some praise and worship.
you believe his word today. I mean, you're thankful for his presence and his power. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can we just reach to heaven? God, I thank you for Brother Max and the word of God that you've just put into our spirit and our soul today. Don't abandon the blessings of God. Let our homes be like Obed-Edom's home where the ark is present and there. Your presence where prayer is there and the devotion of your word and the principles to the doctrine of Christ are being not only taught but lived in our home, God, that the blessings of God, that while the world rages, there is a peace that passes all man's understanding, that I'm walking in the will of God and nothing can happen in my life unless you allow it to happen in my life because all things work together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We claim your promises over your congregation today. Lord, bless them this week, Lord, as they go to work and they go to their homes and wherever they, whatever they have to do this week, we bind up the powers of hell, loose the power of God and your blessings upon us. We take authority over everything that comes against the will of God. Let the kingdom of God be released into our lives. Lord, we receive that today. We receive the word in your presence, and we give you all the praise. Bless the families of this church this week, God. We give you the praise, the honor, the glory. In Jesus' name, can we put our hands together for the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. We will be meeting at 6 o'clock tonight. All that wants to come, pray together and have a time together at 6 o'clock tonight. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Thank you.